Many high-tech products, such as fluorescent lights, photovoltaic cells, and the motors in hybrid electric cars rely to some degree on a scarce natural resource, such as a rare earth element. But that's a bit of a precarious situation to be in, right? Relying on something that we may or may not have easy access to? In the April-May SNTR previews, we'll be talking about what makes critical materials so critical. These rare elements that are necessary for scientific and technological advancement are called critical materials. And one of the organizations that monitors them and their role in U.S. science and industry is called the Critical Materials Institute. These materials oftentimes are very hard to get or their supply can be at risk. And that can be because of a number of different issues. Some of the materials are only come from our mind in one, one part of the world. Or it could be that the material itself is just difficult to get in the quantities that you would need for a, a given technology. So we need these materials for continued development of technologies and to sustain industries, but why is that so important? The availability of the materials becomes a very important issue in the widespread adoption of these technologies that are important for our, clean energy, our transition to clean energy technologies in the U.S. How do we reduce these dependencies? The Critical Materials Institute offers several solutions. So CMI addresses the issue of, of materials criticality with a sort of a three-pronged strategy. We develop technologies that will enable us to diversify the supply of those materials, and that could be, for example, in the development of, of techniques that improve the, the efficiency of mining the materials from the first place, all the way through the entire supply chain. The second area is that we work on developing efficient techniques for reusing and, and recycling the supply of the materials. And the third area then is in developing substitute materials. So materials that could play the role of the critical material but are in much greater abundance. So one of the techniques that we're currently using is, uh, is an additive manufacturing technique called electrophoretic deposition. And this process allows us to have very precise control over the assembly of nanoparticles of magnetic materials in very unique ways that allows us to make, a, say, a strong permanent magnet that has a much reduced amount of rare earth elements in it. In one example, fluorescent lighting contains something called phosphors, and phosphors are blends of rare earth elements. A phosphor is integral to how a light emits light. In order for us to smoothly transition from rare earth elements to more commonly available materials, the replacement must produce the same kind of light, have a comparable lifespan, and fit into existing production pipelines. Demand for rare earths is only increasing as the clean technologies that use them continue to thrive. This means that the world is not only looking for ways to replace these elements, but also more efficient ways to extract them. One development is the use of bacteria. Livermore's genetically engineered bacteria has the ability to adsorb rare earths onto its outer cell wall. The bacteria are then washed in a solution to rinse off those elements, and since the solution doesn't harm the bacteria, they can then go out into the field for another round of collecting. Pretty amazing stuff, huh? If you want to explore more about the topics that we discussed in this video, or learn how scientists are recovering and recycling electronic waste as a source of rare earths, or the role of computations in this project, or how Lawrence Livermore is partnering with other institutions on this, then check out the full issue of the April-May Science and Technology Review. Let us know your thoughts and questions on this topic in the comments below, and don't forget to subscribe to this channel to stay tuned in to the SNTR conversation.